happening now on The Rundown. This is one of the most infectious agents we've ever encountered as a species. And I think the implications of that are still sinking in. COVID-19 is tearing apart the world as we know it. And to contain and control the deadly virus, Montana scientists are in a race against time. It's a race against time, but it's also a race to make sure we develop something that's safe and effective. I'm Jackie Coffin, and I'll take you to the front lines of Montana's COVID research. People, I think, don't realize how cutting edge research in Montana is. I think it's very gratifying that a little lab in a little corner of Montana is playing such a major role. And give you a look at my own experience with the search for the cure. Vaccines are really the most effective medical measure we have, like period. The Rundown starts now. The Rundown is made possible by the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans. When I was a kid, I grew up in, uh, in the Netherlands, in a very, very small town, even smaller than Hamilton, Montana. I used to work in tulip farms. If people would go online and you go to very classic uh, 17th century Dutch paintings of tulips, you actually see those tulips with all these stripes. These stripes are actually caused by a virus, which is transmitted by aphids. And, and that really kind of like sparked my interest in the viruses. I think I've always been interested in science since I was a little kid. I loved being outside and I remember having this creek in my backyard and I would sit and stare at all the little critters in the creek. Um, I had this really, a toy microscope as a kid and I loved looking at the creek water and it was terrible, it was a terrible microscope, but I loved it. My family was really a working class family. My grandfather was in World War II and then started his own uh, auto mechanic shop. My dad was a machinist. I thought I was going to be an engineer just because of the lineage, but I really loved biology. So when I went to college, I switched from engineering to biology and, and kind of didn't look back. I happened to fall into a bat lab in my undergrad, kind of by mistake, and haven't stopped since. Montana is home to national parks, pristine rivers and wilderness that attract visitors from around the world and are a point of local pride. It's also home to world-class research institutions and brilliant scientific minds, quietly working around the clock in some of our larger cities and small towns, forging new paths in science with cutting edge research. Whenever I came back from the park, I was looking through the electron microscope, seeing viruses most of the time that nobody had ever seen before. So. It was a really transformative experience for me. I felt like a pioneer. Science is really an adventure, and that's what really got me hooked. There's just so many unanswered questions, and it's, it's fun. It's, it's exciting to do something where you, you make discoveries on a daily, weekly basis. A dangerous virus is spreading rapidly in China and U.S. officials are very worried that it could come here. As COVID-19 grew globally, spilling into every country and moving towards Montana, scientists in every corner of the state readjusted their sights on the new pandemic, trying to figure out what it was and how to stop it. The people that say no one saw this coming, that's nonsense because a lot of people saw this coming. They're waving the red flag, but nobody's listening. As an expert, we know it would be coming, but you're still obviously still surprised when it happens. As a person and a journalist, I love and am fascinated by science. I grew up in Montana's scientific community. My dad is a professor of molecular genetics, and my stepmom is a professor of neuropharmacology, both at the University of Montana, and as COVID-19 hit, spread gradually, and then like wildfire, it felt natural for me to look to Montana's scientific community for answers. There's no question Montana scientists are at the cutting edge of this. And this took me down a thrilling path on the search for the cure. To whip this pandemic, we need three things. We need antivirals, so drugs that will eliminate the virus. We need vaccines, and we need better di diagnostics. Detection, vaccines, treatment. Detection, vaccines, treatment. 
These are three of the main boxes Montana scientists are trying to check with hundreds of hours in the lab because the three together lead to the ultimate goal, prevention. Everyone has a sense of urgency that we need to get this virus under control. It's a race against time, but it's also a race to make sure we develop something that's safe and effective. Before we get too deep into any of the work being done, let's assess what we're dealing with. First, what is a virus? A virus is a microscopic pathogen that is constantly searching for a host to replicate in and take over. Viruses cannot grow without a host because they're not even a complete cell. They're just a tiny little package of nucleic acid in either DNA or RNA. Every living thing in the world has DNA and RNA. DNA writes our genetic code and RNA translates that code into action. Whether viruses are alive is kind of a gray area. While they contain some of the elements that constitute life, like DNA or RNA, they can't do anything with it unless they find a host organism, a plant, an animal, a person, and use our cells to replicate itself, which ultimately destroys the cells. So instead of thinking of viruses as little creatures, it's more like a microscopic android trying to take over our cells. One host is not enough for a virus and it will spread to host after host, after host, after host, maybe through a sneeze, a cough, a simple touch, or even inhaling and exhaling. Using saliva and water droplets as its mode of transportation, and the mouth, eyes, nose, and respiratory system as its way into a new body. When a virus travels this way, it's aerosolized or airborne. And the way to block it from spreading host to host is covering coughs and sneezes, washing and sanitizing hands and shared surfaces, and blocking its entrance into the new host's respiratory system using masks or face shields. Not every virus can travel this way. Ebola and HIV travel through direct contact with infected blood and bodily fluid. As we all know, SARS-CoV-2, a coronavirus, can, and that's what we're dealing with now. To touch on taxonomy, SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus that causes the disease, COVID-19. But where did it come from? How does a virus manage to infect 72 million hosts in every country and territory in the world? We can find the answers in Bozeman. Viruses exist everywhere, just like bacteria. They're in the air, on surfaces, in water, everywhere. A virus can't run, it can't walk, it can't fly, it can't crawl. They don't come after us, they fall into us. And they generally fall into us because of things that we do more than things that they do. Digging deep down to the roots of global pandemics and infectious disease are David Quammen and Devin Jones. Jones is a PhD candidate at the Bozeman Disease Ecology Lab run by Dr. Raina Plowright on the MSU campus. I ended up here because I was really interested in bat health. I study the gut microbiome of flying foxes in Australia. David Quammen is a renowned science journalist and best-selling author who has tracked infectious disease for more than 20 years. I have lived in Montana since 1973. I travel a lot, usually, to do research for my books and articles. I worked a lot for National Geographic magazine for 20 years. I've worked for other magazines, the New Yorker magazine, uh, Harper's Magazine, Outside Magazine. Again, mostly but not entirely on scientific subjects. I, for many years, covered ecology and evolutionary biology. And then about 20 years ago, I got interested in emerging viruses scary new viruses that come out of wild animals. We call those zoonotic viruses. I got interested in them because I was walking across the Congo on an assignment for National Geographic with an American explorer conservationist. And we walked through Ebola territory for a stretch of 10 days. And so I got interested in the mystery of the reservoir host of Ebola. I realized quickly that this is a matter of ecology and evolutionary biology. I thought, oh, okay, I get that. I'm gonna write a book about the ecology and evolutionary biology of scary viruses, including Ebola. So I did that. It was titled Spillover, published in 2012. 
To source the origins of a global pandemic, Jones and Quammen say you need to understand a process called spillover. Spillover is the movement of a pathogen from one animal into another. So that can be um, an intermediate host. So like with SARS-1 in China, we see that um, that coronavirus moved from bats into civets and then from civets into humans. Um, so that was those were multiple spillover events. So you could spill over into civets and then spill over into humans. Um, so we, our lab studies the process of spillover. So what are those drivers that make spillover occur in the first place? Um, and there are a lot of barriers that a pathogen has to go through in order to spill over into a new host. And so we study those different layers and how those layers either align or don't in order for that pathogen to spill over. SARS-CoV-2 spilled over from bats, a frequent mammalian host to viruses. Bats, bats seem to carry more than their share of viruses that can get into humans and cause trouble. There's a whole sequence of, um, of dangerous viruses that have come from bats as the reservoir host, the species in which they live when they're not infecting humans. Um, and this virus is only the latest of those. Probably Ebola, we don't know that for sure. Marburg virus, Nipah virus in Malaysia and Bangladesh, Hendra virus in Australia, the original SARS virus coming out of China in 2003, others as well. What is it about bats? Well, first of all, bats are a very, very diverse order of mammals. One in every five species of mammal on Earth is a species of bat. But bats should not be blamed, say Quammen and Jones. They're losing habitat to development and deforestation. And we, humans, are putting ourselves right in the path of wild animals and new viruses. Emerging infectious diseases are, at this point, mostly zoonotic and they're spilling over more frequently over time. Um, and so we think that most of that is due to land use change. But yeah, so um, there are teams of scientists like in PREDICT in California and EcoHealth Alliance researchers, for example, have been studying coronaviruses in bats for a long time, like decade plus. And they have previously identified coronaviruses as a high risk virus for, with pandemic potential. And so there's kind of their, they're waving the red flag, but nobody's listening. And so then when it happens, people are like, oh, suddenly it's really important to study these bats and their ecology and things like that. And at the end of the day, I think too, it's really important to note that um, bats aren't the problem, but people um, have sort of invaded their space and taken away their resources to where they have nowhere else to go and they have nothing left to eat. And so that causes like nutritional and reproductive, extra reproductive stress that might um, increase viral shedding, um, pathogen shedding, and increase the likelihood of these sort of zoonotic transmission events. Bats carry viruses. How do those viruses get into humans? It's not that because bats are looking for us. It's not because those viruses are looking for us. Neither. It's because we go looking for them. We invade bat habitat. We disturb bats in various different ways, cutting down forests, uh, harvesting guano from caves. If we leave those trees alone, if we leave those forests alone, if we stay away from bats, then bats will be better off and we will be better off too. As for Kwaman's 2012 book, Spillover, it is eerily prescient eight years later. And at the end of that book, because I was listening to some very smart disease scientists, I put together what they were saying in answer to my questions and essentially predicted COVID-19. They predicted COVID-19. I asked them, is there a next big pandemic coming? They said, yes. What does it look like? Well, it'll be caused by a virus, a new virus, new to humans, um, coming out of a wild animal. What kind of a virus? Well, one that evolves relatively quickly, such as an influenza or a coronavirus. What kind of a wild animal? Well, one that's known to carry viruses that can infect humans, very possibly a bat. Where might this spillover happen? Where might this pandemic begin? Well, possibly in or near a wet market or someplace where wild animals are exploited for food. For instance, in China. So that was in the book in 2012. And as a result of that, I've been getting a lot of calls this year. 
now we know what a virus is, how it infects a host, and how it turns from something carried by a bat into a widespread human pandemic. So how do we stop or at least control it? We need three things. Detection, vaccines, treatment. Diagnostics that aren't, you know, multiple day turnaround time. We need diagnostics that are cheap, accessible, point of care, um, easy to use. Uh, all of those things in one convenient package. And we're trying to deliver on that. On the MSU campus in Bozeman, we enter the labs of Dr. Blake Wiedenheft and Dr. Seth Walk. Both Dr. Wiedenheft and Dr. Walk are finding ways to trace COVID-19 in individuals and in the community through the gut. When the uh, COVID pandemic started, um, we got involved in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first thing that we started doing was testing wastewater for the prevalence of SARS coronavirus. And the reason that we got interested in that is that there was an early report that not only is SARS coronavirus uh, transmitted through aerosols and thus the importance for face coverings, but it's also transmitted in feces. Wastewater is, uh, provides a health record of the community in real time. So with a single test, we can get a sense for what the prevalence of the virus is in the community at any time, and we can monitor that over time. Is it going up or is it going down? And the results from those wastewater tests mirror what's happening in the community, but they do so in a way that provides us that information before we can get it any other way. We began developing some protocols uh, early on in the pandemic in, in the U.S. here around May. Um, there was a, a push to look for uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, in wastewater. And we collaborated with Blake to get those protocols up and running at Big Sky, in West Yellowstone, and then later on at Three Forks. And we did some research in the lab to um, try to make the protocols better and more sensitive. Um, we developed some techniques there. Um, and so we had tested throughout the summer, um, doing weekly testing at those sites and reporting back what the levels were or whether the virus was even there or not. And that kind of helped um, public health and uh, local county health to uh, understand how the disease was getting around and being transmitted and where the hotspots were in the county. The protocols for testing samples established in Dr. Walk's lab came in another use when the state reached out for help processing the immense amount of swab samples starting to roll in midsummer. The uh, National Guardsmen and women, they courier samples to MSU every day from Tuesday to Saturday. And we run the tests and report the results back uh, to the state. And over, over the time, we were able to ramp up our capacity to the point now where we're testing over 2,000 samples a day. It's something about a third of the samples in Montana get tested right here at MSU. So that's pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> Access to widespread testing was an early failure of the U.S. COVID-19 response. Now, drive-through testing is being done at hospitals, fairgrounds, college campuses, including MSU and UM. But better diagnostics are still in demand. Very early on, that only symptomatic folks were getting tested um, because we just didn't have the resources to test everybody. And as resources have been coming online, supplies have been coming more plentiful and and honestly, protocols have been optimized and capacity increases, then we can begin to test asymptomatic folks in high-risk areas. You know, where there are infections, say in a hospital, you can go and test the asymptomatic folks and identify those shedding the virus but not yet sick. And at that point, um, detection is sort of over. Once you detect it, you get a result. That's the end of that phase. But probably the most important phase for decreasing transmission and disease is what comes after the result. And that's with public health efforts like isolation and quarantine. So getting those individuals out of the population and isolating them so they can't transmit the disease is the most important part it, um, without a vaccine, right? And that's pretty much where we still are at this point. The vaccine's coming, it's getting rolled out, but we still need to be aware that if folks are symptomatic or they're asymptomatic but test positive, they need to isolate, they need to quarantine to really stop that transmission chain between individuals. 
So detection is at the heart of that. It's the first thing that we can do. Um, but it's really that, you know, what, what result or what that result triggers, what activities and actions. And that's really what stops uh, the disease and lets us bend the curve or flatten the curve, as they say. The research institutes we are visiting in this program are not limited to any specific aspect of COVID-19 research between detection, vaccines, and treatment. All of these research institutes feature a wide array of work being done by a lot of scientists. Too much and too many to fit into one program. 126 miles north of Bozeman, all three of our silos of prevention are under the microscope at McLaughlin Research Institute in Great Falls. The McLaughlin Institute is a private, nonprofit institution. Um, it's been in existence since the late 50s. As a relatively small nonprofit research institution, um, the strengths of the institute include the fact that we're, we, we can be very nimble. We were of course, like scientists all over the world, very interested in helping, trying to do our part in finding, um, developing technologies and helping the state of Montana develop the infrastructure to, to do the, to meet the requirements for, for this challenge. Things like uh, increasing our testing capacity, being able to do research and developing vaccines and potential uh, drug therapies for the disease for COVID-19. We do a lot of genetic work with mice. An important thing to discuss in the role of scientific research is the use of animal models. M mice have been, over the past decades, have evolved to be arguably the most important model organism that kind of bridges this gap between basic research at the bench before it can be brought into clinical trials in humans. Um, mice serve as an excellent model because although obviously they're a very different organism, they, we share an enormous uh, number of genes in common. In animal models, scientists are able to replicate the virus and keep up with it in real time. As the virus mutates and new forms of detection, vaccines and treatment are tested for effectiveness. At McLaughlin, Dr. Cavanaugh took me on an immersive tour to see their work in progress. I went into labs, I went into the main mouse rooms, I met scientists working on editing mice genomes to create a mouse model on the cutting edge of COVID research. Because we use mice a lot, we were really um, used to developing and make, creating our own transgenic mice. We can now use tech, a technique called CRISPR to genetically engineer mice very rapidly. We actually have a mouse, a new mouse. Mice are normally resistant to coronavirus infection. So we've made a mutation that's specifically designed to change the mouse receptor into a receptor that we think will become now susceptible to infection because it'll, because it'll bind with uh, the spike protein. If we have mice that are susceptible to infection by the, by the coronavirus, we can do a lot more experiments that obviously cannot be done with humans. We can ask about um, you know, what's the efficacy of certain vaccines, how, does, how do they work to prevent infection, um, and drugs that might interfere with infection. In Great Falls, we cross from detection to treatment. Treatment in COVID-19 is a pretty broad concept and umbrellas a lot of options being explored. Unlike bacterial infections, viral infections cannot be treated with antibiotics. Antibiotics are able to kill the bacteria making you sick. Antiviral treatments stop the viral pathogen in your body from being able to carry out its work of spreading to and destroying your cells. Antivirals don't stop you from getting the virus, they just stop the virus from making you as sick. Common antiviral you may have heard of is Tamiflu, which is used to treat influenza. One being explored for the treatment of COVID-19 is remdesivir, approved by the FDA in October and already being used in Montana hospitals. Detection, treatment, vaccines. Outbreaks like this really show that vaccines are really the most effective medical measure we have, like period. Before COVID-19 was even confirmed in the United States, Montana scientists were already trying to develop a vaccine for it. And for that, we head first to Hamilton. 
Rocky Mountain Laboratories, or RML, is part of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is in part one of the 27 institutes and centers of the National Institutes of Health, located mostly in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, our director is Dr. Anthony Fauci, and if there's anybody in the state of Montana or anywhere else that hasn't heard of his name before, I would be a little bit surprised. Rocky Mountain Labs is one of the 13 biosafety level 4 labs nationwide, meaning it can secure some of the world's worst pathogens that are airborne, very fatal in humans, and have no known cure. My visit to Rocky Mountain Labs was on a hot day at the end of July, but I was lucky to get a tour with RML Associate Director Dr. Marshall Bloom. Well, you can trace the antecedents of Rocky Mountain Labs back to around 1900 when uh, uh, what we would call now an emerging infectious disease began to show up on, uh, on the, the west side of the Bitterroot Valley and in the Bitterroot Mountains. It was a new disease. Nobody knew what caused it. There was no vaccine. There was no treatment. A lot of people that got it got really, really sick, and a fair number of people died. And no one knew what this was. It had several names. It finally became known as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And uh, an infectious disease physician, pathologist from Chicago named Dr. Howard Ricketts, uh, was one of a number of people that came out right around 1900 trying to figure out what this was because it was a cause for uh, serious concern. Within a few years, Dr. Ricketts had showed this was an infectious disease that was transmitted by the bite of a tick. And others that came to Western Montana uh, to study Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and other diseases which were being carried by ticks went on after a few iterations to uh, start a laboratory that was part of the U.S. Public Health Service which in the mid-1930s officially became called Rocky Mountain, Rocky Mountain Laboratories. And when the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease was created, Rocky Mountain Labs became part of that National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. It's a historical uh, incident that brought infectious disease research uh, to the state of Montana and to the Bitterroot Valley. Over the next 120 years, RML scientists would take on major roles in fighting emerging diseases like Lyme disease, prion diseases like mad cow and chronic wasting, and very notably the 2014-2015 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. It also includes other coronaviruses that caused diseases familiar in our collective memories, the first SARS outbreak in Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. It was that experience that put us in such a good position to shift from the studies that they were doing to look at this new emerging infectious disease, the SARS coronavirus uh, type 2. <clears throat> and Dr. Munster and some of his colleagues here at Rocky Mountain Labs, notably, notably uh, Dr. Emmy DeWitt, because they had worked on uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus and SARS, what we now call SARS coronavirus type 1, or the SARS that circulated around 2002 and 2003, they were key tuned in to the fact that there might be another coronavirus coming down the line sometime. And as a consequence, when the first reports of a new infectious disease popped up in China, and the sequence of that virus was published so rapidly, Dr. DeWitt, Dr. Munster, and others, they were ready to go. And within a period of a couple of weeks, before there was ever a case in the United States, and before there was even any virus available to work with in the United States, they had laid out a very sophisticated and very important um, research plan to study this new pandemic uh, virus. And boy, were they right. It turned, it's turned into a big deal. Poised to respond to the pandemic was head of the RML Virology Unit, Dr. Vincent Munster. Dr. Munster tracks deadly viruses and works with partners across the globe to stop them. Typically, 
uh, within my lab, we look at a lot, a lot of different things. And most of the things are actually quite fundamental. So we kind of study the genome. We kind of study different changes in the genome of viruses and, and see how they become potentially more transmissible. We do a lot of field work, for instance, in Africa, where we look at natural reservoirs. So in this case, we immediately started realizing that we completely should focus on public health. And that's what we did. And we have a long-standing collaboration, for instance, with the Jenner Institute in Oxford. Um, so as I already explained, the moment those sequences, so that genetic information, uh, that blueprint, so to speak, of that virus came out, we immediately started communicating with my colleagues at Jenner, uh, who are from a vac very well-renowned vaccine institute, and they started making vaccines based on that information. On our end, we started really working and getting all the tools together to test those vaccines. So the moment they actually got the first vaccines, they got transported here to Montana. We tested the vaccines here in the lab. That data was then immediately shared back to the UK. They started uh, what they call phase one and phase two clinical trials. So the first human experiments. So they are now finalized, although it originated from Oxford University, that vaccine is now licensed to AstraZeneca. Detection, vaccines, treatment. When a virus enters our body, it begins to multiply very, very fast. Billions of infectious viral particles start attacking millions of our cells, making us very sick. Our body's immune system recognizes something isn't right and begins to fight back by producing antibodies. Antibodies block the virus from taking over and destroying cells. But if our immune system hasn't seen the virus before, it can take a few weeks for it to reach full speed and produce enough antibodies to stop the virus. Basically, it's a race between the virus and the immune system. If our immune system wins the race, we recover. If the virus keeps winning, we can be ill for several weeks or even die. That's where vaccines come in. Vaccines help our body win the race. The majority of vaccines take dead or weakened virus and expose them to your body in levels the body can withstand, triggering your body to create antibodies so when the actual virus rolls around, your body is ready to fight it off. These are traditional vaccines. In the race to find a COVID-19 vaccine, we are seeing for the first time a different type of vaccine that instead of using dead or weakened virus, uses the virus's genetic code to jumpstart your immune system into making the antibodies without any exposure to the virus. Vaccine-based immune memory can last for years or even decades. But as many of us know from flu vaccines, sometimes it only lasts a short amount of time and we need a new vaccination or a booster. Vaccines are the quickest, safest, and most effective way to build a defense against a deadly pathogen. Without question, with the exception of clean water, vaccines have saved more lives than any other medical invention in history. It's, it's, it's clear that they're, that they're effective, it's clear that they're safe, and we need to continue making sure that vaccines are safe um, when they're administered on a wide scale, like, like this COVID vaccine will. The emphasis has to be on safety. At the University of Montana in Missoula, Dr. Jay Evans' lab focuses on taking vaccinations and making them stronger and more effective. The Center for Translational Medicine uh, was started by our group about four years ago when we, when we moved from GlaxoSmithKline up here to the University of Montana with the idea of helping university researchers move um, inventions and discoveries that happen here at the University of Montana um, from the research labs to the clinical space uh, for helping people. Our unique niche is what are called adjuvants and delivery systems. It's ways to deliver a vaccine that enhances the immune response um, through both delivery, how you deliver the vaccine, as well as immunostimulants or adjuvants that are added to the vaccine that boost the immune response in very specific ways. Dr. Evans' lab was able to respond to COVID-19 almost immediately tapping into a recently awarded NIH grant and turning the funds from one vaccine project to another. Our group has been working on the COVID-19 COVID vaccine um, since February. Um, pretty soon after uh, the outbreak in, in Wuhan, China, um, and it became evident that this was gonna be a, a worldwide problem. 
Um, we started discussing with the National Institutes of Health ways that our group can help uh, advance vaccine uh, discovery and development around COVID. Our group's been working on vaccine research for over 30 years. Um, so we have a lot of experience in the area. And here at the University of Montana, we have about 45 people working on our vaccine discovery and development team. Um, so it was a pretty natural transition for us to move over to start working on, on a COVID vaccine. With the work done by scientists across the globe, including Montana, vaccines against COVID-19 emerged in an unprecedented amount of time. It's incredible, it's incredible. It's really just a testament to the people, how people have worked together, both government agencies and universities and, and, and large companies uh, to make this happen. But not everyone is impressed by the development of vaccines. Some people stand staunchly against vaccines, prevention methods, pleas from public health officials and overwhelmed medical workers. Some doubt the virus exists at all. As we look ahead to vaccine rollout, a major struggle will be convincing Americans to take it at all. New vaccines come with a lot of questions. Will this work? Is this safe? What will it do to my body or to my kid? Who wants to be a guinea pig for some new science experiment? Well, so I do. Comes a little poke. On September 4th, I got up early and drove from Missoula to Bozeman, jumping at a last minute chance to participate in the Pfizer vaccine trial. Pfizer, a US-based pharmaceutical goliath, known for creating Viagra, is one of the leaders in developing a COVID-19 vaccine and was in need of 44,000 human participants to sign up to try out the experimental vaccine in phase three human trials. This includes about 100 Montanans in a trial being conducted out of Bozeman Health. To my knowledge, it is the only COVID-19 vaccine study happening in Montana. To qualify for the study, I had to be in relatively good health, not be immunocompromised or pregnant, and not participating in any other types of trials. Check, 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 check. The study is a two-year commitment that includes six visits. Five of the six visits are blood draws, which monitor the level of antibodies the vaccine creates in my blood and how long they last. These are some of the main questions Pfizer is trying to answer in this study. Is this vaccine effective in preventing COVID-19? How long does it take to work? And is it safe once it's actually in humans? My first visit was a blood draw and my first shot. An important note is that Pfizer's study is a one-to-one -one double-blind study, which means that for every one vaccine administered, one saltwater placebo is administered as well. Double-blind means neither I nor the physician giving it to me knows what I got. Bozeman Health and the vaccine research team gave me permission to shoot this video. I might not look. I do a little bit well, better with I'm shots if I don't look. <laughs> I'm going to ask you not to look because Pfizer is very particular, even though this is totally mad. Oh, right, of they course. They don't want you to get even the least clue what you've got. What I, what I have. So, comes a little poke. Put a band-aid on that. Oh, wow, that was easy. <laughs> Much easier than my blood draw. <laughs> Very different outcome. Well, I will let you know if you do happen to have any sort of symptoms or side effects from your injection. Uh, we've seen them with both placebo and active, although on our side, we, we don't know who has, or we don't know who is experiencing what. Right. Give us a call right away. Okay. So we want to track that, uh, as, as your research methods class would dictate, that we want to track that data and that side effect <laughs> profile for this. <laughs> but we also want to make sure that we can put you in touch with providers and get you the care you need if, if there's anything concerning to you. So. Okay. I kept a video log of my experience as it went on. Hello everyone, I want to do a two week update since I got my first dose of the Pfizer COVID-19 trial vaccine. Uh, I feel fine. I've been asked that. I've, I've had no reactions except for a little bit of itching on my forearms that happened within a couple of hours after I initially got the shot. Uh, and I don't know if that was an allergic reaction to the shot or something in my environment or any, any matter of things, nothing concerning to me, nothing I was worried about. So I am 
Sitting in my car outside of Bozeman Health Hospital, I just got the second round of my COVID-19 vaccine. In this arm, same arm I got the first shot in. It's a booster uh, three weeks to the day after I got my first vaccine. Um, a booster is part of RNA vaccines. It's required any, if this vaccine goes to market. Other people will have to get boosters of it too. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about the process. This uh, appointment I just had was only less than an hour long. Um, unlike my first appointment, they didn't take all my my specs, draw my blood. Uh, this was not a blood draw appointment. It was just a booster. The second vaccine, a lot of questions I've been getting about it is after I got my first vaccine, how do I feel? If anything happened to me, I feel great. My next appointment is in a month and I will be getting a blood draw. And the next three appointments after that will be blood draws too. All the rest of the ones will. And all it's looking for is COVID-19 antibodies in my blood to see if these vaccines were effective in building antibodies. One thing about that is even if I do, is it enough antibodies to prevent me getting sick with COVID-19. That's one of the big questions with these vaccine trials. Still a lot of information we don't know, but we're learning as it goes. So I'm here waiting to get my COVID test, sitting outside in the parking lot in my car. On Friday, today's Sunday, on Friday, I started feeling like a little cruddy, sort of along the lines of maybe seasonal changes. It's fall here in Montana, so now it's cold, and I, I get a cold this time of year pretty frequently. Then yesterday morning, Saturday, I woke up, and I didn't realize it at first, and I was drinking a cup of coffee, and I thought, this coffee has absolutely no flavor. And that's kind of when I realized I didn't have any, I had like lost my whole sense of smell and taste. So I went and brushed my teeth and I couldn't taste the toothpaste and then all day I just couldn't smell or taste anything. So I figured I'd come and get tested because although I'm congested, I can still breathe through my nose. So losing my sense of smell and taste was very strange and concerning to me. Um, I don't know if I've been exposed to anyone with COVID, um, not to my knowledge, but I travel a lot for my job. Uh, you know, I go to grocery stores and I'm, my office is on campus, so it's could be anywhere. It could be an exposure from anything, or it might just be a cold, and hopefully my test results come back negative, because that would be great. But I'll let you know. So I just got off the phone with the clinic, and I did test positive for COVID. Um, I don't know when and where I contracted it, and they told me they're going to contact me in a couple of days to begin contact tracing. So an important part of this vaccine study that I've been participating in is recording all of my symptoms or lack of symptoms on a weekly basis and on an app in my phone, as I've shown you guys. And as soon as I reported any COVID symptoms, they immediately called me and I've been checking in with the research team um, every single day and they're asking me how I'm feeling. But one thing they really want me to do, even though they I released my positive COVID test results to them, they really want me to um, self-swab myself with this kit they sent me. So there's a swab right here. And there is this little vial of fluid that will preserve my results. And it has a um, barcode on it. And then I have my home self-swab requisition card. I have my biohazard specimen bag. And they're gonna come pick this up as quickly as they can, which will in this case be tomorrow morning. This is the self swab. And I already called them a little earlier. They'll pick it up at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Fortunately, I had a case that did not turn into a hospitalization or death, and I feel really lucky for that. Within two weeks, my symptoms cleared and I was released by the health department. I had a follow-up with my vaccine team right away and had an additional blood draw added to my visits. Getting sick with COVID-19 made me assume that I got the placebo. And that's what I still think. But it's also possible that I did get the vaccine and that I still contracted the virus. Maybe I was exposed too soon after the shot, and maybe it made my case less severe than it would have otherwise been. But that's impossible to know. In early November, Pfizer released some preliminary data showing its vaccine was 95% effective. 
Pfizer's data shows that out of the 44,000 participants across five countries who received either the vaccine or placebo, there were only 94 cases of COVID-19. Something that's really important to know about this is that at no point in the study did Pfizer expose me to COVID-19 to test the vaccine. That's something that I've been asked a lot, and that was definitely not a part of the study. Also, Pfizer's vaccine is an mRNA vaccine, so it does not contain any dead or weakened virus. It contains the genetic code that tricks our immune system into producing antibodies. It will be the first mRNA vaccine brought to market for use in humans. And if it proves effective in preventing the spread of COVID-19, it will be a huge medical breakthrough. My participation in the study continues and my next appointment is a blood draw in March. And in full disclosure, I do get paid for this study. I signed up as a volunteer, but Pfizer compensates study participants with $129 per in-person visit and $5 per diary entry. Pretty much enough to compensate you for your gas, your time, and to incentivize you to stay with the study. My case of COVID-19 at the end of October came at a time when cases were soaring in Montana, which was sad and hard to see. But a vaccine seemed to be coming on the horizon. Detection, vaccines, treatment. But as we have all witnessed, there is so much more than that when it comes to beating a pandemic. Supporting medical workers and hospital staff, securing enough personal protective equipment, a coordinated central response that gives every state, every agency, every person a clear course of action, and community buy-in to follow the plan and the advice of your state, local, and national experts in science and health. To get perspective on all of this, the worsening caseload, the hope for a vaccine, I checked back in with Dr. Bloom and Dr. Munster. We're speaking now in November. We met originally in August. Um, from where you are, what has changed? First of all, uh, as, the, as your audience knows, uh, the situation with the virus in the state of Montana has become, there's no other word to describe it, but dire. You know, all of the hospitals are at capacity or worse. Uh, even here in Hamilton, the emergency room doctors uh, wrote a letter to the editor saying that, you know, folks, we can't accommodate any more uh, patients. And so the situation is extremely dire. And uh, it's really unfortunate that um, people aren't, aren't getting the message about what we can do today, you know, to try to slow this down. You know, as Dr. Fauci says, WWW, you know, wash your hands, watch your distance and wear your mask. I think we're still in the in in almost like an interim interim period. Uh, I think everybody is almost in a holding pattern. I think the major the major change is obviously uh, the surge in COVID nineteen cases in Montana. Um, that like when we when we had our interview in August, there were relatively few cases in uh, Montana, which I think gave people a little bit like a false sense of security that that Montana might actually get up with, with like relatively limited impact. Um, now, obviously, we know that that's not the case. Then on the research front, obviously, there's been um, now two good news reports on one on the Pfizer vaccine, and the second one is the Moderna vaccine. Moderna vaccine is the one, one of the two vaccines where uh, NIH was directly involved in, um, in particularly the Moderna one is the vaccine research center out the east. So um, we were directly involved in the preclinical development of the, the Oxford vaccine, um, now the AstraZeneca vaccine. So we're still waiting for like uh, um, the phase three clinical trial data to be released from that study. So um, when they started their clinical trials in, uh, in Europe, predominantly in the UK, but also in South Africa and Brazil, there was rel relatively few cases. So if you don't really have that many cases, so like, like to, to couple that back, like it's probably good that you got COVID in the sense of getting that vaccine fast track. Like obviously they comparing 
placebo vaccinated people with actually vaccinated people and then they determine the efficacy. Um, but you can only do that if there's enough uh, circulation of COVID. And I think they kind of hit, hit the jackpot in, in Bozeman, so to speak, uh, which of course, it's not very nice if you get it, uh, but it's good for the vaccine progress. But I think um, uh, it's very, very, it's very encouraging I think the fact that we have these vaccines, but uh, one of the things, and I have a friend who's a virologist in Australia, his name is Ian McKay, and uh, he came up with a wonderful analogy that said that the countermeasures against coronavirus, you really need to think of them as like a block of Swiss cheese. And Let's take, for example, masks, okay? If you consider mask to be one slice of Swiss cheese, the virus is gonna be able to get through some of those holes, okay? If you consider washing your hands and social distancing as other slices of the Swiss cheese, the virus is gonna be able to get through some of those holes. And you know uh, the medications like remdesivir and decadron, dexamethasone, each of those is an individual slice of a block of Swiss cheese. And a certain amount of virus may get through each of those slices. But if you look at the entire block of Swiss cheese, the holes don't go all the way through. So the block of Swiss cheese, which is the slices all put together, is gonna be effective. But uh, uh, any one of the individual measures, there may be some virus that sneaks through. But I think it's a really important thing for people to understand um, that, um, th that it's going to take, in all likelihood, multiple measures, multiple slices of Swiss cheese uh, to really uh, put the skids on this pandemic uh, entirely. But each one of those measures are going to be effective to a greater or lesser extent. December is a point of celebration and relief as Pfizer's vaccine made it to market, with approval first in the UK and on December 12th, approval in the US, allowing rollout immediately. Pfizer's first shipment of vaccines includes 6.4 million doses, enough to vaccinate 3 million people, as the vaccine requires two doses per person to be effective, just like in my study. Vaccine ethics committees determined the first people vaccinated in the United States will be frontline health care workers, which accounts for about 20 million people. Pfizer's vaccine comes with complicated distribution details. It has to be stored at a super cold temperature of negative 80 degrees Celsius. Freezers, many hospitals, especially in rural or low income or tribal or inner city areas may not have access to. There's also pressing ethical questions of who will get it, when, and if there will be equality in access. We don't need a vaccine, we need a vaccination. If the vaccine, if the only place the vaccine exists is in a freezer in New Jersey, or the only place that the vaccine can be delivered is in metropolitan areas that have the ability to do it. Uh, that's not very good. We're slated to As Governor Bullock shipments. explains, Montana has a plan in place for receiving and distributing the vaccine. Earlier this week, we announced our state's plan for the very first doses of a COVID-19 vaccine. We're slated to receive our first shipments of the vaccine as early as next week after the vaccine grant gains FDA emergency use authorization. We expect to receive 9,750 doses of the Pfizer vaccine through the state's allocation, which will be delivered to 10 of Montana's major hospitals in the seven largest communities. Those first in line to receive these initial doses will be Montana's healthcare workers, who've served tirelessly for nine months to care for the people of this state under very trying circumstances. And in the coming rounds, that will also include the Moderna vaccine, likely a week later, pending FDA approval. We'll be targeting healthcare workers in our more rural areas, 
as well as healthcare personnel and residents in skilled nursing facilities. These are the healthcare workers who put their own health at risk while on the job, or they may have had to temporarily isolate or quarantine due to the risk that the job poses. By prioritizing the vaccination of those on the front lines, we can help ensure that our hospitals have the staff to continue serving patients while we wait for the widespread distribution of the vaccines. The first shipment of Pfizer vaccines arrived in Montana on December 14th, and later that afternoon, I witnessed the first doses being administered to six healthcare workers at Bozeman Health. And honestly, I felt really emotional. Receiving the first dose is Dr. Andrew Sullivan, one of our pulmonologists and intensive care physicians. A year after SARS-CoV-2 spilled over, wreaked havoc, and changed all of our lives, exhausted and relieved healthcare workers are getting their first shots. My name is Eric Lowe. I'm the medical director for the emergency department at Bozeman Health Deaconess Hospital, and I've also been working on the incident command team here throughout the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Today was a very exciting day. Uh, we, as a hospital system, we received our first doses of vaccine. Uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech um, COVID-19 vaccine, and we were able to administer our first six doses this evening. Emotionally, it felt fantastic to see this finally come to fruition. It's been a long, it's been a long year. I think for everyone everywhere it has, but uh, speaking for the emergency department uh, in particular, it's been, it's been a tough year. Um, dealing with constant change and uncertainty and the unknown, and the fears that go along with that um, are grinding. And to do that day in and day out for month, month upon month without a clear end um, has made for a, a very long year. Well, I think this is something that really should be celebrated. To think about how many people's efforts went into getting to this point is, is kind of daunting. From the, the scientists to the airlines that were delivering this, to the delivery people, to um, it, it really took, uh, took all of us to get to this point. It's felt like we're in a long dark tunnel and now it feels like there's a light at the end of that tunnel. The rundown is made possible by the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends and values of importance to Montanans.